This is Our Voices, Our Legacies, the Medical College of Wisconsin's Oral History Project. I'm Dick Katchke, MCW's Chief Historian. Today is February 21st, 2017, and we're talking with Dr. James Euchre. Dr. Euchre is the Professor and Chairman Emeritus in the Department of Radiology. Um, he joined MCW in 1968 as the Chairman of the Department and served as Chairman for 45 years and holds the distinction of being the nation's longest serving department chair uh, for a medical school. Um, he is also recognized uh, in the radiology community as one of the international leaders, and he has been awarded the gold medal, the highest honor uh, in the field of radiology by the Association of University Radiologists, the Radiological so Society of North America, the American Wrench and Ray Society, and the American College of Radiology. Thank you, Dr. Euchre, for, for speaking with us. Um, you went to school in New York, uh, medical school uh, at the University of uh, Buffalo, I believe. You did your residency training at University of Minnesota. That's correct. You came to the Medical College of Wisconsin in 1968. What brought you here? Um, what was it about this position, and who are the people that you talked with at the time? Well, the head of the search committee was Ed Ellison, and he was an extremely persuasive fellow. Uh, who'd uh, made some real contributions, was internationally recognized for what he'd done. And I saw this as a great opportunity. At the time, it was only the county hospital, but uh, clearly there was a real opportunity here. And I was glad I had the opportunity to take advantage of it. Who were some of the other people that you talked with in addition to Dr. Ellison? Well, Dr. Engstrom in particular and uh, Dr. Schultz and Dr. Manningly. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty small medical school at that time. We had just it was separated. very small, and we were stationed in the county hospital, which is obviously has significant limitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, the medical school itself was still based down on, on the Marquette campus. Yes, it was down, downtown. Mm -hmm. Had to go down and give lectures down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a significant disadvantage. So in 1968 when you came here, again it was a small medical school, uh, we were based down on the Marquette campus still, you were out at the county hospital right. at that time. Um, what were some of the, what was the state of radiology then? What was, the, what was the technology that you had to work with? Well basically it was just plain films and fluoroscopy. That's been the exciting thing about being in this field is the tremendous advances that have occurred uh, brought to us by industry and, and real innovators. But there was no ultrasound, uh, there was no CT, there was no MR. It uh, all came, came here. And uh, that's what's made it so exciting. What was the, as you look at the, uh, the equipment as it came online and, and the training, what? What were some of the challenges and opportunities as you saw? And it also provided you an opportunity then to recruit some faculty members too to help work with the new uh, technology. Yes, we had a very close relationship with General Electric and they were testing their new equipment here. As a matter of fact, they took a wing of the old county hospital and put a facility in there for testing their equipment there uh, so they could test it on real patients. So it was extremely exciting, and I think it was one of the reasons we were able to retain the faculty that we have been able to retain, is the fact that we were at the cutting edge of the new technologies. And what were some of the tech, uh, some of the people that you recruited and some of the technologies where we were at the, the cutting edge? Well, at CT, Dennis Foley had played a key role with General Electric in advancing their, the, their equipment and, and utilizing it in, in a very... Uh, effective way. Uh, Tom Lawson was with us. Tom went on to be chairman at Loyola. Uh, Vic Houghton was uh, with us in neuroradiology and utilizing CT in its early days. Uh, Alan Williams. And they, they were the first ones to recognize uh, that you could see herniated disc without having to do a myelogram, which was a great advance. And you also had Dr. Scanlon to work with, I believe, at that time. Yes, too. we have to talk about that because Dr. Scanlon came with me uh, in 1968. And without his effort and without his stress 
on the importance of clinical development, we never would have had the success that we had. He was much beloved by our residents and the faculty throughout the whole institution. Unfortunately, he did pass away. Mm -hmm. But his name lives on through uh, you know, a symposia, I believe, and a lecture that we have. Yes, it does, mm -hmm. and very appropriately so. Mm -hmm. Who, you know, radiology is such that you interact with almost every department within the institution. That's correct. Who were some of the other department chairs and some of the other leaders within the institution that you were able to build collaborations with? Well, we developed a very close collaboration with GI, with the gastroenterologist, um, with Conrad Sergel and uh, Dr. Hogan. And Wiley um, Dodds, I believe, was another. Well, I might bring that up because Wiley Dodds came from the University of California with me and developed our research program. He got a very strong research program going, and it was because of his ability to work collaboratively with the people in gastroenterology. Uh, once again, we, we lost him, unfortunately. And how about surgery? That was another department that you worked with as well, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, we did work closely with surgery, um, with Ellison at the beginning and then his other people that came on after that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the technology, in addition to the CT scan, ultrasound was another technology that, that uh, developed. And uh, again, Dr. Foley was involved uh, with that, wasn't Dr. he? Dr. Foley remained very involved with it. Um, as a matter of fact, GE, recognizing the importance of clinical collaboration here, established their facility right across the street, right across I-45. And that was an example of the impact of the medical school and the impact of, of our department. One of the other things that's interesting about your department is that it uh, helped create additional departments and programs within the institution. One is radiation oncology. Can you tell me a little bit about the recruitment of Dr. Cox and Dr. J. Frank Wilson? Well, initially, they were part of our department. But recognizing that there was tremendous advances to be had in that area, I, I realized that eventually they need to be an independent department. Initially, um, we had a radiation therapist here, uh, Maury Greenberg, and then Frank Ellis came from Oxford. Um, but we were looking for a younger, very aggressive person who could do the job, and we got Jim Cox, who went on to be a chairman at uh, Columbia Presbyterian and then medical director at, uh, at uh, MD Anderson. So we were fortunate to recruit him, and then also, while we're still in our department, we recruited Frank Wilson. And my, my pride in this place is that I was able to recruit Frank, and he's had a tremendous career and had a major impact on cancer treatment throughout the whole area. One of the things that was also part of the Department of Radiology was electron spin residents. And you helped recruit Dr. Jim Hyde then to MCW. Yes, we did. We recruited him and uh, he had tremendous success. Uh, over a period of time, it became apparent that he needed his own department. And so that he'd established his biophysics department. Again, the the institution was a young institution, and there were young leaders within the institution. Um, we mentioned Dr. Schultz, Dr. Mattingly. With those two, you, you were some of the influential department chairs that worked with the leadership to help set the direction of the institution. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Who were the leaders that you worked with? Now, Kerrigan was the dean. What was his leadership style? He was a very detail-oriented person. Um, and uh, very careful of what he did. One of the things I didn't realize that when he'd recruited me is that there was no money for my first month's salary. And uh, <laughs> the Board of Trustees had to pass the hat around to get enough money. I, of course, had uh, a family, little kids, and uh, a house in Elm Grove to pay a mortgage on. And fortunately, nobody told me about that until 10 years later. And succeeding Dr. Kerrigan was Dr. Ed Lennon. What was Dr. Lennon's leadership style? He was, a, he was very much involving people in a very positive way. He, he was an extremely positive thinker and um, looked at what the potential was 
and people and opportunities. He, 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 he was very opportunistic and, and I think very effective and a major force in the development of the school. Now, David Carley came on as president. He was our first full-time president. Do you recall working with him at all? Oh, indeed. That was fascinating to be involved with as dynamic of industrialist and politician as David. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and he, again, brought some skills that we really needed. I think as I look back on the school and the leadership, we were fortunate to have the right people at the right time. In Kerrigan's case, we needed a tenacious person who could hang on. And with Lennon, we needed somebody who could start to develop some esprit de corps. And then with uh, Carly, we had somebody who could help us build a building. Uh, so, and then in, in Buzz Cooper's role, he tremendously increased the research activities because of his connections with the, the uh, NCI. Uh, so that we've been fortunate here to have the right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, you also saw Mike Dunn as the dean then as well. Yes, indeed. I had been on the search committee for medicine and tried to recruit him here as chairman of medicine uh, unsuccessfully. And um, then he came back as a candidate for dean, and it was a real pleasure working with Mike. And Mike Bolger served as the president, and if I recall... You were the first person to float his name as a candidate for the president. Yes, I was. I was on the search committee and uh, very proud of what happened. What made you think that Mike would be the right person to be president at that time? Well, it was clear that, that we were a new phenomenon in the community. And we needed somebody who had real community relationships. We could have brought in a scientist from some other school, some other part of the country. But he knew what was going on in town. And that's what we needed, and that's why I thought he did a great job and why we were fortunate to recruit him, and I was glad to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with Dunn, what was Dunn's leadership style as, uh, like as the dean? He was one that also looked to the future and tried to move the school as aggressively as he could. Uh, he certainly, uh, there was a lot of collegiality with, with, with Mike. Uh, and so people felt that they were part of a team. Today, we have Dr. John Raymond as the president and Dr. Joseph Kirshner as the dean of the medical school. How do you view their leadership style? Oh, I think they're a great team. I'm, I'm very impressed by what they've been able to accomplish. I just look outside at that new big building going up and I realize what John Raymond's been able to do. So uh, they're certainly on their way. And I think they, they recognize the need to relate to the whole state in a way that we didn't. In the early days, we were really worried about what we could do here in Milwaukee and in our hospitals. And I think they've, um, both of them have expanded what our outlook is in a very positive way. Now, going back to some of the people that you worked with uh, in the earlier years when you were here, Dr. Robert Condon, um, what was he like as the chair of the Bigger than life. He was a very forceful person and uh, extremely effective, very much loved by his department, and uh, did a great job. Dr. Ernest Henschel was the chair of anesthesiology. Do you recall him? Oh, very well. Ernie was a very fascinating guy. Uh, came here as a real investigator and research-oriented person and was responsible for setting the Department of Anesthesiology into its strong research mode. Now, he was succeeded by John Campine, and John was an alumnus of MCW as well. Did you get a chance to work with John Campine then? Oh, yes. We worked very closely with John. And John carried on the Hensel tradition and uh, uh, did a great job. Mm -hmm. he, did, he did have the advantage of having gotten an advanced degree from here in basic science, so he brought another perspective, uh, another dimension, which it, it turned out to be extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked before about you were based at the county hospital back then. Um, at that time, how did that hospital compare with the others in the community? Was it just serving the indigent patients, or were you getting other patients as well? No, we got other patients in. 
uh, but it, not very many. And uh, it was largely um, indigent. Um, but we had, as we got specific programs uh, with some of our leaders, they were able to attract patients. In 1980, Freighter Hospital opened on the campus, and radiology was one of the exceptions in that you were located both in the new Freighter Hospital, but were also based in the old county hospital then as well. How did you manage that? Oh, that was a story. There were two separate hospitals. There was a connector between the two of them. The initial connector that they had, which was somewhat below ground, collapsed. And uh, they uh, was fortunate we had a resident there. He ran like hell and got away. Um, but there were separate programs. Uh, some of the programs were in freighter. Neurosurgery was there. Um, other programs remained within the county. And it was a totally untenable situation. So you had to duplicate facilities and We equipment. duplicated facilities in both places. How's residency Yes, training? when I came here, they, we did not have a residency program. We got the residency program approved, and that, uh, that was a major accomplishment. At that time, the residency was only three years. It became four years. The program became a lot larger. Uh, we were able to recruit really outstanding people. And uh, I'm very proud of what the residency program was able to do. We now have our, our people are scattered across the state and across the country. Um, and I run across them at meetings and all, and uh, they've done a great job. In terms of the continuation of that program, Bill Carrera was responsible for really putting teeth in it and making it as good as it's been. Now, you and he really had a great partnership going. In that. Oh, yes. We could not, I could not have survived here without what he's been able to accomplish. He took care of the day-to-day -day problems, and I looked at the more global issues. Mm -hmm. And you were also then the, interacting with the chairs of all the other departments then too, so you, you had the bigger picture and he had the daily operations. Yes, I think that's an accurate description. Mm -hmm. now, but through it all, he was particularly concerned about the education program and still is. Mm -hmm. What were some of the changes that occurred over the years in residency training? Well, to start with, there were a lot more things that they had to learn like ultrasound, CT, MR, it uh, extended, expanded unbelievably. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the number of residents change over the years then too? Did you grow? Yes, it did. We grew. We're mm -hmm. up to eight per year. Uh, now, more recently, we have a residency program in interventional radiology. And so some of those positions will be used for that. In fact, I was going to ask about interventional radiology. When did you begin the interventional radiology program, and how did that get off the ground? Well, I got started with neuroradiology when I brought uh, an individual from the University of California, Los Angeles here. Uh, he actually arrived even before I got here and developed a strong program in, in, in neuroradiology where there was a lot of use of catheters and all. And then it expanded, then I brought in uh, a fellow by the name of Frank Madison from University of California, San Francisco, and he started more of the uh, non-neural interventional work, and that continued to develop. Um, we, uh, Bill Rilling then took the program over after uh, two people left for private practice, and briefly we used people from the community uh, to help, and then he did the program now, so it's uh, entirely our program and uh, has worked out very well. It's a nationally recognized program. You know, we mentioned uh, Jim Hyde before, and one of the things that developed in his area was the whole field of functional magnetic resonance imaging. How has MRI and functional magnetic resonance imaging... Well, that's imaging an interesting story, because when I first heard about MR and recognized that there was some real potential, I went to Jim, who was in the ESR program, so he was dealing with electrons running around, and uh, so that I said, Jim, this is not that far from what you've been doing. You got to take an interest in it, and he did, and he became became a major leader in the whole field. And with some of the people working in his laboratory, he developed functional magnetic resonance, which has had unbelievable uh, success nationally, internationally. 
Now, one of the things that we've got here is the 7T magnet. What has that kind of capability provided us? Well, it's given us the opportunity to, to look at areas where we couldn't see the detail before. You see, each one of these steps we took has given us the opportunity to see more and more detail. As I indicated at one time, with CT, we were able to then see herniated discs so people didn't have to have myelography. And, and we've been able to do that in all of these areas. We've avoided uh, exploratory surgery. We've avoided many of the other things that uh, patients don't like, and we've been able to spare them. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen medical education change over the years here, too. Um, initially, it was two years that were in the basic sciences, then two years that were in the, the hospitals and clinics. Have you noticed changes not only in the curriculum, but the kind of student that we get the way that medical education is, is practiced? Well, I think there are major changes in medical education. There's major changes in, in the students that we have coming in. Um, they're very involved early on in, in the clinical work. They want, to, they want to be involved in the clinical work. And I think that's very good. Um, but their demands of a medical student today, looking at all of the new areas that have come on, is, uh, I think, uh, very challenging. Now, one of the things that you've also done is you've established yourself as a leader in the field of radiology. You've become very involved in some of the national organizations. And why did you get involved, and what has that leadership enabled you to achieve here at MCW? Well, I, I think that it, it's taken a lot of time getting involved with these organizations. But I always thought that they were going to have a major impact and you couldn't just sit back in your own little shop. You need to get involved. And as a consequence, um, we got to know everybody. And when we got to know everybody, it helped us in our recruiting for residents, faculty. Uh, so that I've, I think that the involvement we've had nationally has been very beneficial for this place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you've been the recipient of gold medals from four of the, the leading radiology societies. What's that mean to you? What, what does it mean to get that well, kind of recognition? tremendously satisfying. <laughs> you know, it's uh, just have people say, uh, we think you're deserving of a gold medal. It's, it's personally extremely satisfying. Your department is also very active in research. What were some of the areas in research that you feel the Department of Radiology made major contributions? Well, obviously, in biophysics and what uh, I did, and particularly with the whole area of MR. But early on, uh, Jerry Dodd uh, and his research in esophageal motility was extremely important and was a, a key to the development of gastroenterology here. It was an example of the two departments working together were able to produce a very significant results. The role of the physician in relationship to the medical team has changed over the years as well uh, in that now we've seen nurse practitioners, physician assistants, you know, pharmacists are taking on expanded roles. How has the, the medical team changed? Oh, I think that's real and I think that's a phenomenon that's going to continue. Um, the the well-trained Nurse practitioners do a superb job, and uh, we've become extremely dependent upon them. It takes a little while for the public to get used to the fact that these nurse practitioners can do just as good a job as the physicians can, and in many cases, probably better. MCW has expanded now where we have new campuses in Green Bay and central Wisconsin. We've created a new school of pharmacy um, we'll be looking to see if we need to create additional programs down the line. How do you think that the expansion, uh, both geographically as well as programmatically, impacts the quality of care and the patient care that we provide, as well as the uh, educational experiences that we offer? Well, I think in terms of, of some of the local areas that I'm more acquainted with, I think we certainly are going to upgrade the quality of care in the hospitals that Freighter owns here. Um, so far as the material 
what's going on up in the middle of the state. I'm not really well aware of it, but it clearly is the direction the medical schools are going, and I think John Raymond is correct in, in moving it in that direction. It's uh, very new and very different than what we were doing to start with, but I think very necessary. When you look at the institution as it was back then, you know, smaller medical school, and then look at it what, is, what it is today, what do you think, in, in addition to the growth, what, what are the major changes that have occurred here? Well, it's bigger. So now that it's bigger, people don't know each other as well as they did before. It's, it, uh, there isn't the collegiality that existed before. And that's, that's just a function of size. How about the reputation of the institution among other medical schools, among other leaders in uh, medicine? Oh, I think we're well recognized now, which we weren't to start with. You know, I was, can't tell you how many times I got introduced as a speaker from the, from the uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, fortunately, that's passed, and now they know who we are. But we we fought that uphill battle for years. As as you interact with leaders from other medical schools in the nation, what is their what what do they view as the the thing that stands out about the Medical College of Wisconsin? What do they know about our radiology program? Well, they know the people, and and our our guys around, our guys and girls are around, our women are around talking. Uh, across the country in various subjects. Mm -hmm. One of the people, in fact, you know, when you mentioned women, one of the people we didn't talk about before was Catherine Schaefer. Yes, the mammography program here was an interesting program. When I first came here, I had a federal grant to establish a teaching program in mammography uh, because it was a new field. Nobody knew how to do anything about it. It was basically one of these see one, do one, teach one. And that was, that was it. So I came here from the University of California where I was running a program and started it here and was fortunate to recruit John, the late John Milbrath, who then established the program, moved it along, recruited Kay Schaefer, and Kay, who's become a well-known figure in the field, um, continued that program. In fact, it really became one of the premier programs in the, uh, the region, wasn't it? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were the program that was doing the teaching. Is there anything the same about the institution? Is there anything about the culture here, the personality of the institution? That's well, I think there's still a cohesiveness here, a uh, esprit de corps that's, uh, that's very real. We're not part of a big, big university, uh, so that uh, I think people feel their, their loyalty, their relationship with the school. So I think we've maintained I might say kind of a small town atmosphere, even as we've become a big town operation. As you look back, what are some of the things that you're the proudest of? Well, I think uh, the recruitment of um, Jim Hyde, and particularly the recruitment of Frank Wilson, and Frank has been a major force in the school and the community. So I'm more proud of the people I recruited. I'm very proud of our residents who played a major role throughout the state and the country. I'm very proud of how our faculty that we brought in here have grown and have become uh, internationally recognized. Larry Goodman, who uh, did a great job in st establishing CT as a way to diagnose uh, pulmonary embolism, uh, recently gave a lecture, an international lecture in, uh, in Europe at an international meeting of radiologists, which was extremely well received. So uh, our, our, our gang is well recognized. What's next in the field of radiology? Where do you see the field going? How is it going to change in the next 10 well, years? Well, it's going to get at the molecular level. Um, and uh, I think MR will continue to expand. Um, as a matter of fact, it's gotten to the point where I have trouble understanding what's going on. It's uh, moved so rapidly and uh, it requires so much input from the basic scientists. And uh, we now have some really good basic scientists who are pursuing grants that I think will be very successful. And as you look at MCW, where do you see this institution going, as well as Freighter and Children's? 
Where do you see us going in the future? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges we're going to have? Oh, I think that what, what our role is going to be is the real challenge and where the patient's going to come from and who's going to pay for them. I think one of the opportunities, and Bill Handy, who is a radiation physicist, a very good friend of mine who served here um, in the administration, pointed out our importance in dealing with other institutions, and particularly programs like UWM, which doesn't have a medical school, but has a lot of people working in areas related to medicine. Uh, so developing collaborative programs, I think, is, is key. And I hope we'll continue to do that. The thing that's been most exciting to me is to be part of radiology at this time. And for me to sit here and say I knew it was going to happen would be a bold-faced lie. I had no idea that it was going to move in the way that it did. And it's been just a real unique privilege to be part of the field. Well, thank you, Dr. Euchre, for your leadership here at the Medical College of Wisconsin and your leadership in the field of radiology. Um, you've made a mark. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.